Welcome to the Town of Deerfield Select Board Board of Health meeting for July 13th, 2022. The time is 5.05 p.m. This is a hybrid meeting, Zoom in. Uh, the meeting's held on Zoom and the main meeting room at 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, Mass. Meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access uh, and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's Baker's June 16th, 2021 Act, extending certain provisions of uh, the COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, including an extension of the remote participation provisions of its March 20th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20. There's remote meeting uh, information uh, down on our agenda, which you can find on the town website. On the bottom right corner, there is a calendar and our meetings are there. You can click on the select board meeting. You will see um, a, a hyperlink to be on the Zoom meeting. There's also a dial-in number, a toll-free number of 833-548-0276. The meeting ID is 911-604. 1580 and should you need the passcode it's 570012. So I will call the meeting to order. So uh, first item tonight is an uh, executive session. So uh, the chair declares that a quorum of the select board is present. I do declare Tim is here, Carolyn is here. Um, the chair, uh, I, I declare that the, an open meeting session may have a uh, detrimental effect on the bargaining position and negotiating position of the town. So, um, here's a motion I will read pursuant to general law, chapter 30, a section 21, a three and six subject to the chair's declaration and a roll call vote. The select board will meet in executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with Massachusetts UPS EU Highway and to consider purchase, exchange, lease, or value of land, Merrigan Way, formerly Oxford property, between the town of Deerfield and New Pro LLC, as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect <coughs> on the bargaining position and negotiation of the town. Can I have a second for that motion? Yes, I will. Second, Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote. Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Tim Hilchey. I Carolyn Ness. Thank you. The chair invites it, uh, other uh, officials to participate in the executive session, and we will invite in um, Kate Federoff, our, our attorney, and um, let's see, we'll invite, is Kevin, oh, Kevin Scarborough is here as well, and then, um, and Casey Warren, I believe will be entering in for executive session. And then we will return to public session probably right about six o'clock, hopefully. And uh, we've got a packed agenda tonight with a lot to do. So um, we will be back shortly. I guess if you could set up the room, Jennifer, we'll be good to go. Thank, Thank you, you all. Good. So, we'll so back. welcome back to the Select Board Board of Health meeting, July 13th, 2022. We're back from executive session at 6, 7 p.m. Uh, so we have um, scheduled appearances. We'll wait for... Uh, Peter Thomas, who's going to come and visit with us from the 350th celebration, uh, give us an update on that. Uh, select board um, reports. Anybody have anything? I have a couple quick things I want to hit in the beginning of the meeting here. Um, I do this for Sue from the rec department. Ultimate Frisbee Clinic. Everybody should come. Um, so learn with Frontier High School players, the state champs of 2021. Uh, kids second through sixth grade, Wednesday, July 20th at 5 uh, 30 p.m. It's one hour. The Memorial Field in South Deerfield behind the library. It's a free clinic. Donations will be accepted for the Franklin County Community Meals Program. So any questions can contact Brady Birch, uh, Brady A. Birch at gmail.com. It's sponsored by the Deerfield Rec Department. Um, Ultimate Frisbee is a blast. So come get the kids to play. And Frontier, again, are the champs of 2021, state champs. Also, the Deerfield Recreation Summer Concerts are off and running, and uh, Chicken Wire was great on July 8th, and uh, so July 15th, the 60s experience, July 22nd is Southern Voice, uh, July 29th is TJ and the Peepers, these are uh, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. on the Memorial Field, 
They have a little stage back there and um, good music and please come in and join. So that uh, is what I have. Just wanted to update you all that we got um, Kevin. I want to thank Kevin. He went and got some shelving for us for over at the church. Oh, so, so we got four that. started. They're over there. We haven't set them up yet, but they're in that entrance way. I think I was looking, we have room for eight. I decided four was probably plenty to start with. I think it'll do well, okay, but perfect. we'll get that up and running. So okay. we just need um, to schedule. Do we have a dumpster date? I don't know. Uh, Jennifer is ask. working on that, and she's know. also working with um, the sheriff's department to see if we can get some volunteers. Either that, or trying to work with the high, trying to line up some time so when we have the dumpsters. And I know that the dumpster um, facility was also looking to donate some time or some staff to help too. Oh, so, perfect. which is really nice. Yeah. So, so we need to take care of that. Yeah, we want to get that scheduled this month or August and be ready for when yeah you know get, okay. get them rolling so um i think that is it got some sewer meetings coming up this to friday working on some things so yeah that's about it i don't really have much else okay other than um did you just want to mention that jim mcgovern was here and he was, yeah he was sure really you, yeah we could talk about that um and i know the dot meeting update is here too so jim mcgovern came on Friday and uh, was, I think he really enjoyed our presentation on uh, Denise Mason was here, the um, chair of our uh, CCI group and uh, Connecting Communities Initiative was here and we gave Jim McGovern a um, good overview of the plan that we would are working on to have a Deerfield campus and all the different improvements that we want to do in town. And um, he was very excited and wants to meet with us you know, every couple of months to see where we're at. He was trying to think of different ways that federal grants to help or earmarks here and there. So I think um, it was a great meeting. Yeah. Worked really good. And um, I'll, I'll hit the DOT stuff later if you've got other things. Well, I, I just, I had a Northeast NACD meeting and I, um, I'm not on the task force. I've stepped back, but the new Farm Bill task force um, did meet and um, I got an update and it, it looks like there is a lot of um, programs that we could participate in um, that will deal, help us deal with water, too much water. Mm -hmm. So, and not enough water out West. So um, um, it seems like it's really focused on, you know, helping us figure out what we're gonna do in the Northeast to be more productive in the next five years. It's a very different farm bill from the last three. Mm. And um, I have really good, feel good about who the people are representing us um, on, on the task force. So that's, that's very productive. Good. Um, and that sort of fills, follows that we're starting the, I'm on the subcommittee for the soil health on the state. We're meeting next week and hopefully we'll get ready for the new governor on this. Mm. And, um, and we can update Jim on that and yeah. he'll be very excited, I think. Good. So one other thing um, I wanted to mention too, that I uh, had a meeting I don't know if it was last night, might have been even last night or the night before. It was about uh, the um, uh, a town common committee met, and um, Jeff from Berkshire Design was here, and we talked about um, our meeting with DOT. And I know that Jeff has a meeting with DOT with Bow to talk about crosswalks and how to make those safe. And so we're getting started on the planning and making some tweaks to the plan. There may be some adjustments to the crosswalks and the walkways based on DOT's input. So we're kind of getting all that figured out. We talked a lot about the fountain, um, how to make it safer so it's not so deep of water. We talked about recycling the water, trying to come up with a way. There, the idea is to put, um, there's these stilts that go in the basin and then there's uh, pavers that go on top of that. So it really makes it more shallow and um, but you could then use the reservoir underneath that to recirculate the water so we're not constantly just running the water district uh, commissioners have reached out to me and, and, and our committee to say look we're, we're wasting too much water just running that all the time so we're thinking of ways to do that the ice sculpture in the winter is a challenge everybody loves it but I'm not really sure. So we're trying to figure out how to make that work. A lot of communities, Florence, they, every, you, you'll see a lot of fountains, they get, they turn them off, they get covered up, you know, with um, 
with, you know, wood and just, you know, are protected for the season. Um, everybody loves ours, uh, but it's, you know, so we're, we're trying to figure out what to do there. Nobody will be pleased either way, but we'll figure something out. So, uh, so it was a good meeting. Just and we're, sticky buns. <laughs> okay. Sticky buns, did you say? Yeah. Um, I think we need more than sticky buns on that one. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, Tim, sure. Um, yeah, out of sight, out of mind. Um, I just wanted to say I've been uh, meeting with different groups in town. Uh, this week it was Eagle Brook and uh, the uh, DA, uh, Matt Sheehy, and Jeff Galini. How do you pronounce What's Jeff's last name? Um, you mean for for Bement or? Um, no, no. Um, oh, Galley. Deerfield. Galley. Yep. Galley. Galley. Yes. Yep. And they were both interesting, you know, just introducing myself and right. talking about, um, you know, their their concerns and hopes for the town, um, but mostly just introductory so that they know who I am and I know who they are. So That's super helpful. thank you, Tim, for doing that. Yeah. I, I appreciate outreach. it. Anything else you want to hit on? No, the, everything else re relates to things that are on the agenda later on. So. Oh, okay, good. That sounds good. All right. Well, we'll um, we have um, an appearance by Peter Thomas. So welcome. How are you? Good. Come, come on up to the to the table. We'll make sure you're mic'd up. Peter, thank you so much for coming. Oh. Oh, this is exciting. A little information about deer. Oh, bar oh, grass? Yeah. Oh, grass. oh, this is interesting. Yep. You know, um, uh, bar grass. We'll, we'll get, poor Tim, we'll get Tim to have this. This yeah, is even by hand. Email, I can send him one. This isn't uh, even yes. Excel. I've, this got, is, I've got a couple of extra ones. This is by hand. Well, you yeah. know what? We, it, <laughs> by we, hand, it's happening. I'll take Tim's and I'll put it in this box. So okay. having the um, graft is really, I think, really Yeah, cool. I've got Tim's here. Oh, yeah. OK. Oh, wait, no. No. So, they're two different items? Yeah. Um, so just before we get started, okay. we are starting plans for the 350th. Yay! So here's a. Uh, little poster on Stebbins Mill. Stebbins Mill. Various aspects of it that we can use for demonstrations, for talks, for whatever. That's awesome. And there's no. two more in the hallway out there that I set up earlier. Whereabouts was that? Uh, it's at the bars. I can't hear you. No. That's where the this mill was. Mill, this was Mill Bill. Peter? Yes? We can't hear you. You got to talk into the mic, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Talk into the mic, yeah. Um, okay. You know what, Peter, it would be so, so lovely to have, you know, copies of those, of that done so that we can have them. Well, I, I intend to make them available and when we get through, town's got them, right? Yeah, if you want them. Yeah. I, I think that is so cool. So what this is, is it's called Stebbins Mill. It started out as Stebbins Mill in the 17, it was built in 1791. Okay. And um, then it became a village around where Melnick's dairy farm is right now. Okay. And there were all sorts of operations there. But one of the things that makes this mill really fascinating is that, as you might surmise, mills running on water have what they call a head race, which is bringing the water to the mill. Right. And then a tail race. Well, the head race for this particular mill, Stebbins Mill, is over a mile and a half long. And it starts just downstream from Stillwater Bridge. Is that right? Went all the way? When they hand dug it all the way down through there. Along the edge. Well, yeah. you know, across some places. There's, this, there's a map here that actually shows you where it is. Oh, that's great. But there's a picture here of, in, of that uh, mill race full in the 1890s. Nice. So you can actually see what, what yeah. it looked like. Oh, that's cool. But that's just by way of announcement. So I think I want to talk about two things. One is what we're, some of what we're planning for the 350th. Okay. And then to talk about um, a new program that we've just 
uh, approved through the steering committee uh, last Monday, which is an oral history program. Mm -hmm. But by way of the 350th, and, and this is part of the context for the oral history program, um, we've had, I guess, by se seven 50 year anniversaries in Deerfield. And for the first six, basically the focus of remembrance of history was on the colonial and the revolutionary period, mm -hmm. old Deerfield focused, the town center. Yeah. And that's still an important element of Deerfield's history. But that basically stops in 1780s. Right. And what's happened since then is not only have we continued to have that resident population, but other immigrants have come into town. And so the graphic that I just gave you is looking at the Irish, the German, the English, and the Polish Eastern European populations. These are births of children born in Deerfield, both with immigrant parents. Hmm. So well, if we begin in 1850, up to 1850, pretty much everybody was Yankee in some manner. There mm -hmm. were a few French and Irish and whatever in the mix, but it's like two or three people, families within the town. Mm -hmm. But after 1850, things change. And if you look at the graph and focus on the red and the green, these are the German and Irish kids. These are the kids of German and Irish parents. Wow. And you see there's a real peak there. Huge Irish. Yeah. And then again in 1910. And what you, what you see... Of the Irish, if, if, if you take it in total, between 1850 and 1910, 47% mm -hmm. of the kids born were more or less of Yankee parents. 26% of our population, 26% of the kids born were Irish. Wow. Of Irish parents. 12% of the kids born were German parents. Yeah. And... The unfortunate thing is I'm still working on the data beyond 1910, yep. but the Eastern European population arrives roughly 1895. Uh, so it's only Polish, Ukrainian. Yep. Okay. And that's the yellow. That's, that's the, the yellow. One, that's the one that ends in gotcha. 1910. With the huge... But you can see where it's going. Oh, it's, it's going up. It's yeah. going. It, there, there are more Polish kids born or Polish um, parents born in Deerfield then and this shows on the second page where I've tried to the heavier line at the top no, this is kids born to resident parents that is they were born in this country when you look at the pop you look at that line and it goes down and down and down starting from the 1850s it's all over the place Old resident. Oh, okay. I see. You see you what I'm saying? The old right resident. Here. Yeah. To the this point where right in, in 1910, where you see the yellow line going up. Yes. Crosses. The local population is going down. Yep. And you've got more immigrants coming in. So one of the things that the, the, the graph shows is that in the first 20 to 25 years, 1850 to 1880, both German immigrants and Irish immigrants come in big time. Mm -hmm. By the 1880s, that they have become second generation and they're being absorbed into the resident population in that 1880 to 1890, 1900 mm -hmm. era. And then the Polish folks are coming in in 1895. And if I can get it into up to 1830, you're going to see a huge peak in there. Yeah. And then what happens when I was in school, 
here at Frontier in the late 50s and 60, early 60s. The, we were second or third generation there. Right. And now those families have blended into the population of Deerfield long term. Right. And so essentially where I'm going is that we've had more than 100 years of immigrant, a significant immigrant population in this town that really needs to be commemorated. Yeah, I agree with that. And so that in part is what got us into talking about oral history. Yeah. Because the last sort of thorough history of Deerfield was written in 1896. Okay. That's, that's George Sheldon's history of Deerfield. And that's and colonial George, kind of. George Sheldon talked about the Yankee families that he grew up with. Yeah. And there's virtually no mention in there of, of Irish or Germans even coming to town because he cut it off before 1850. Oh, I see. And that's when the big spike came. That's when the spike sucked. Yeah. So yep. we were missing 123 years of that history. Which and is the a only huge place part. that we're going to recoup at least a significant part of it because people have not written from those German, Irish, Polish perspectives in terms of their own history. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some articles and things that have, have been written, um, but there's nothing trying to bring it together. And there's a lot of memory that still exists in terms of those communities, particularly the Polish and the Ukrainian community. Mm -hmm. uh, we're fortunate that PVMA back in the early 90s did some recordings of elderly people, one of whom uh, was an elderly lady, 92, Polish ancestry, who actually grew up in a village in Poland. Okay. And what's interesting is her last name is the last name of the first kid born in Deerfield. Wow. And I'm sure we can put them together, but that would be a continuity. But we've also looked and several of the families that were recorded in 1993 still are in town. So we may be able to get a continuity of cultural memory, family memory through time. This started out with a newspaper article in, in uh, Greenfield Recorder talking about an oral history program that Northfield wanted to start. Yes, I remember was, seeing that. Chris wrote. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. Uh, all right. So yeah. anyway, um, both Marie, my wife and I looked at each other and we've been talking about doing oral histories for a long time. And, and the fact that we needed to um, bring this element to our 350th. So uh, based on that, I got a hold of the two oral historians who are going to assist uh, Northfield in, in starting to develop their capabilities and they live in Sunderland and um, Michael and Carrie Klein yep. um, between the two of them they've probably got 50 years professional experience doing this um, they're very easy to to work with they're great with people and they've got the intellectual and the capabilities to to really help so they've agreed to become a, a part of this program uh, both in terms of coaching and to do some critical uh, interviews themselves. And when we, when they can do the interviews, then we can train people, but we can have them come along to see how interviews are then done. So it can be part of a learning process as well as part of the development of that um, database in terms mm -hmm. of oral histories. So the intent of the uh, monies which we allocated uh, last Monday with the steering committee is to get us going, is to initially fund the training uh, and to fund the, um, the interviews, uh, the follow-up to the interviews. Um, and we're, we've set aside the, what we're gonna do about the, the equipment budget, I think, 
we can we can resolve that in a different way. But this gives us some money to get off and started, and and the Great. claims are ready to go, and and I think we're ready to go too. So um, just That's to bring exciting. you up to date, and we approved that la at our last meeting, right? Because she brought that to us that needed, and we decided to start spending some of that money from the that we've been setting aside yeah. because we have funds ready to go to to launch that. That's exciting. I'm really. I, I think it's got the potential. I mean, we we're sure we're getting into the 350th anniversary and we've got a whole year, but this has the potential to be a long-term program. Mm -hmm. you yeah. know, if we can get enough people recruited and trained, we could continue it long into the future right. beyond the 350th. There's great but stories. That, that creates a reservoir of information that's not attainable any other way. Right. It's, it, it will be a wonderful legacy to leave to the town. And we just don't want to take the chance of losing more people that, because yeah. you lose that history then. Mm -hmm. I mean, I it think is. it's fabulous. Jonathan has been wonderful. He's volunteered to work with um, our 350th and Peter and Marie mm -hmm. and everybody is working together very well. Very excited. Yeah. So the, the clients have just gotten back from West Virginia. They're, they're also folk singers. Um, and they've done a lot of work in the coal fields and that sort of thing, wow. making podcasts. And it, there's some wonderful CDs that they've made and stuff. And that's ultimately where I would like to see, not only do we have the repository of what people have to say, but we can extract out of those histories of individuals, um, themes and other things that you can bring together, put together into a, a summary of podcast that you know right. maybe it take five minutes maybe it take 10 minutes who knows um, but there's a lot of information out there to be gathered and, and uh, i'm looking forward to, to starting that's great i appreciate you wanting to help with this and, and get it going I'm, I'm really getting excited about the 350th that's you know there's been an awful lot of work and peter can you just explain some of the history um sessions that you're going to do yeah, um, please. Because I think people have no idea um, that this is going to be valuable and open all year long. Peter's going to be scheduling this from now I, until. I could really sit here and listen to you read the phone book, but it would be <laughs> better to hear the history. Well, I'm, I'm not about to give a history of history, but it, in terms of the how do you approach history, I think it, it's, it's going to be done in multiple ways. Um, when... I began thinking about this and agreed to work heavily in history because that's my background. Um, I made contact with both Historic Deerfield and PVMA. So they're on board. We have a liaison with both of them. Great. So one of the things that will happen is we'll coordinate programs that they put on as well as what I can muster in other ways. Yep. So one of the things that I would see coming out of the oral history program, for example, is somewhere in the middle of next year, we can probably come back and present an initial part of what's going, you know, what, what we've come out of the oral history program. Right. Um, I'm going to try and set up a number of talks um, about Deerfield's history. I've, I've been at it long enough so that yeah, I can tell stories and I won't repeat myself That's too many, too many times. It is. It's great. I think one of the things that um, we need to do, we need to think about is where can we hold these sessions? I mean, when Deerfield or PVMA has a, um, you know, a, a talk series or whatever, they have the White Hall, they've got, they go to the, um, the academy mm -hmm. they've got the educational building there i would really like to see something down here and i'm going to throw this out and you can think about it and that is with the church here i was just thinking about that there's too. absolutely no way why that open church with the pews you couldn't put a, a big screen up on what's now the, the since the organ's gone the big stage and the you know the altar and all that stuff's gone it's just a platform why you couldn't put a projector and a screen in there and it'll hold 150 people and it's easy access 
uh, and even handicapped, you could put a ramp out the front door for that matter. We're, but we're going to be know, fixing it up so it will be handicap access. Yeah, so it, that may work out really well. And the other thing I was going to ask you, and, and there's a um, a room on the back end of the church, small uh, conference room. We used to use it for offices, but that would be a really nice room for uh, having people come in to trans or to do an oral history. It's quiet. It's small. It's local. Um, so anyway, the, we'll find somewhere. We'll we'll find we'll find a way to do that. But I, I think a lot of local talks with an opportunity for people to ask questions. And one of the things that I've been kind of working on is just these kinds of things. Yeah, I love that. You know, there's love that. Um, I've I've done one for some of the houses up on North Main Street where around where I live. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, we're very fortunate to have is about 250 pictures of houses in South Deerfield, particularly, but also out of Mill River that were taken in 1900. So 120 oh. years ago. Oh, wow. By the Howes right. brothers. And they're cool as hell because one of the things that the Howes brothers did was whoever was living in the house at the time, they got them to come out and stand out front. Nice. So you not only see the house, but you see the people living there. That's really cool. And um, so what I did with that particular section of the street is I put a map there going up the street and uh, used the 1912 fire insurance map, and which blocks out all the houses at the time and sort of put them on the street. And then there's a picture of the house today and there's a picture of the house then. And some of the things have, have gone through really horrendous changes that uh, unless you've been here a long time, you, you just would never know. I mean, the the Nap, Napka, Nap, Napa yeah. car parts place, there used to be a three-story factory there. Yeah, pocketbook, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it was even bigger. Yep. In the 1890s, and I got a picture of that. Yeah, it's uh, great. Larry Forcia's wife uh, gave me that. That was handy, hanging in the barber shop years ago. Um, across the street from me is where Harold Wisley lives. Well, Bill Gass tore down the building that was there in 1933, and then he discovered the bottom front of that building was the original 1750 tavern. Wow. That was up on North Main Street. So he pulled the house apart, took the tavern, and remade it as the tavern behind the Indian house on Old Deerfield. Okay. So if you want to see the layout, but yeah. I have pictures of actually that place gutted. That's pretty neat. Um, you know, other places look pretty much the same, except the uh, King James or St. James Church, which was originally the Monument Church, and they moved it down the street, rolled it down the street. <laughs> and set it up where St. James is today. But St. James was modified in the 1920s. It was, they added a portico, they added a, a belfry, but you can still see the lines of the original church there. Okay. So anyway, it's, it's, just, uh, it, it's just fun history. And I think one of the things I wanna encourage people to do when I put something on uh, Deerfield Now uh, yesterday is to, get people interested in doing a history of their house. Um, mm. Or they could get into genealogy. So yep. I've talked to Jen at the senior center and she's gonna uh, bring in a program of ancestry.com. Right. So seniors can go in and look at and try to work on their genealogy. And I think what uh, myself and a couple other people may well wind up doing is doing some workshops and showing people how to do this. Right. Um, I just did one for uh, Rocky Foley yep. on, on the Bryant place. Nice. And it led to some really interesting findings um, among which the Bryants lived there, but it was not their original homestead. They came from Springfield. The house is probably 80 years older than that. And uh, it was owned by a man named William Tryon, uh, who came here in the 1790s. 
So we went back through the deeds and probate and it's good it's stuff. Really could, cool. yeah. could, look, could look at the history. And I think a lot of people can do that. So okay. it, it's, it's just looking for various ways to present things to the public, but engage people to do some of their own exploration. Yep. Uh, and I think both, you know, some of the old houses, a lot of those are going to be sort of Yankee oriented, but that doesn't matter. You had 80 years of, you know, Polish yeah. ownership too. For sure. Um, so. Well, thank you. <laughs> I guess Peter, I'll stop you. there. Yeah. No, Peter, thank you thank very you much. Thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, I, sure. I it's fascinating. It's going to be really exciting. Very yes, Peter, I'm, I'm not in the room, but I want to say thanks too. And also, I know it's uh, 170 plus years since the Irish potato famine, but uh, it would be interesting to see if there's still some echoes in the Irish community about family stories from their great, great, great grandparents. Yep, absolutely. Um, since we grow a lot of potatoes around here, it'd be interesting. Yeah, there is a lot of potato farms. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's while I, I've sort of focused on the, you know, the Polish and the Ukrainian communities because of the more recent, but I'm not going to lose sight of the fact that we need to dig. And, uh, you know, Tim, if, you, if you've got uh, contacts or whatever, if people can feed in, I think one of the things that I would throw out there is because of the oral history program, we need people from all ethnic communities or descendants, yeah, whatever. And if you've, if you know of anybody that has memories related to the potato famine or coming from Poland or coming from Germany or whatever, yeah. um, please get in touch. Okay. Um, and, and we can work those into, uh, right now we're in the process of trying to identify really good um, people to interview. Yep. So it's a perfect time. If you know people you think would really um, you know, have those kind of memories and, and uh, can at least talk. Yeah. Um, well, Bob Decker you know, for one, it, right? Yeah. He's, got, he's got quite a memory. Yeah, he's uh, he's on my list. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's, that's good, good for the lot. German community. <laughs> yeah, a lot okay. to get. So thank you so much yep. for coming in. I really all appreciate right. it. And we'll, thank you for waiting for we'll us keep in touch. to come out of Yeah, no, it's quite all right. I was just a little concerned that I missed it. Nope, no, okay. none at all. Um, Do so, I turn this off? Nope, it'll just stay on. You're good yeah. to go. I'd love Thank to, you. Uh, you know, I'd love Thank to you. take a quick picture of that before you go. I just want you to. Well, you might, I, I tell you what, I'll leave the other two here okay. or, I'll, or I'll set this one up too. That'd be great. And we'll go. Let's see what's here. And, uh, but yeah, you can see, you can see Stillwater Bridge is up here. Oh, yeah, that's the mill down there. Oh, and this is the dairy, this is Mellon's dairy farm. Wow. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to take it to that. All right, I'll set this one up. I'll, 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 all or you want to here? Anywhere, anywhere that's good. I'll just, I'll just put it in the back. Okay. Uh, you know sure what? People I, can actually, see people are come when they come through, Peter. Yeah, we'll are more see. likely to see them if you want to set them up by the doorway. By the door or in this or right on this yeah, area you know here. What, you know where the table is there? Yeah. You anywhere there. You can just there. Lean, lean it against the windows. Oh, okay. against the yep. Poster. Yeah, because then people can get to see it. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you. Okay, um, we did select board reports and announcements, correct? Yes. Um, yes, yes, we'll, we'll hit that as well. Um, any, uh, so um, before we move on, we have public comment. Uh, anybody in the public wish to address the board? Annalee has her hand raised. Hi, Annalee, welcome. Hello. Um, just um, a thank you for the um, continued uh, attempts to try to get people to fill out their senior housing surveys. Um, we have extended our deadline for two weeks. Uh, there are surveys out in the uh, front foyer um, and people can follow the directions there. It's a little bit challenging uh, to some degree because it needs to be um, with a special computer code, but um, we're there to help people and please, 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 this is not the same survey that was filled out um, three or four months ago. That was about the senior center. This is for senior housing. So um, if people 55 and over have not filled out the survey, please do because it will um, be very important for us with 
demonstrating um, the need and um, hopefully getting some funding. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment and reminding people to fill out the survey and they've extended their, their time. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Nobody online. Thank you. Nobody here. So we're moving on. Um, Board of Health, health agent discussion items, reports, announcements. Well, I first? just want to say mosquitoes, we've been trapping and um, testing our mosquitoes. It's been steady, even though it's been dry um, and there's no disease load, which is good. The perturbance um, uh, have been limited as well as the menorahs, which is what carries the triple E. And it, because it's so dry, I don't think we're going to have a bad season at all, which means that um, but there's no real water, so there's more attraction to the catch basins, mm -hmm. which is your Kulix kind of mosquitoes. And um, so we have that risk, but Ke um, Kevin and the highway department has been treating the catch basins. So we, you know, hopefully will not have any disease load this year. So that's really good. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Sentinel site uh, located on either side of us for um, Asian tiger mosquitoes, which is your Zika mosquitoes. None have been trapped so far. Good. So that's Just a good our thing. First trip of the, or West Nile, West Wild, not West Nile disease case that just came out. Well, the first yeah. one, but it was in the town of Easton, yeah. which is, you know, really Somebody Easton. online can hear Alex. Oh, he wants to speak. Oh. Alex was saying we'll today, me. today we were notified of the first West Nile case in um, Massachusetts, but it was in the town of Easton. It was not anywhere near Deerfield. We, we are doing fine. Um, um, we're working, I'm part of a, a working group with um, a grant that has paid for an epidemiologist and we're working on ways to figure out how to keep the schools open and safe. Um, we're meeting weekly, that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm also participating in the Harvard COVID outbreak group. Um, that's very exciting. So we'll, we'll have some more information as we go on. Um, the BA5 is um, what seems to be circulating right now. It is evades the vaccine a little bit more efficiently than some of the other variants. So please be careful. Take a test before you go to big events um, and just try to wear your mask if you're in a big group and, and there's a lot of mix of people that you normally don't hang out with. I mean, we're we're really trying to keep people safe, but the, the numbers are steady. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two people are at every here about every day. Oh, somebody you know has it, or so yeah. it, it's still going around. I mean, again, if you're vaccinated, you're you should do okay. You can always, you know, it's a fickle disease, so you never know what you're going to get. Um, you may mention this, but I'll just mention again we have tests here. Um, Alex is keeping an eye on kind of the stockpile and putting them out. So, um, if you don't see any when you come in, there's test home test kits here. Um, you're able to take two um, and you know check back if you don't see any. That Alex might get a chance to up, you know if we get more in or whatever have a chance yeah. to put some out. So they they may They're not always like <laughs> they may not always be there, but they uh, a lot of times they come in and there's a pile there. So we recommend people take some, keep them at home in case you you know you have a close contact or you're feeling ill. You know you want to take that test and, and protect your family and anybody you're gonna be around. Yeah, and I just wanna say that the reason why I'm not in person at Town Hall today is because I had a close, very close contact for about an hour with somebody who tested positive on Tuesday morning. So right. out of an abundance of caution, not wanting to get anyone else. Although I probably am not infectious at this point anyway, even if I end up with the disease, but um, anyway, it is out there. And so just be yep. cautious. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Um, Alex, do you have anything you want to? Uh, no, yeah. just the usual septic, uh, camp inspection, pool inspections, just, just the usual. The normal, normal? The okay. normal, normal. <laughs> oh, uh, there was the, uh, nope, that's it. That's it. Okay. Nothing, nothing else you want to hit on? Nope, that's it. All that's right. It. Um, anything I want to hit on on that? I don't think so. Do anything else on that? No? Okay. Um, 
So moving on to discussion items, uh, or did, would you do this school? You were just giving an update. Yes, that you're working, we're, doing we're the working, working we're, we're trying very hard to come up with what will be the protocols, but mm -hmm. the problem is these variants are very different from the original oh, thank you. Um, Delta and the original um, variant, I mean, the original COVID is because, you know, so our thresholds have to be different, our triggers have to be different. And, um, you know, it just, we need to, we have less data points. There's DESE of the Department of Education has decided not to do pool testing to continue that. So, um, and our MAVEN numbers are really messed up because people are doing home tests. Right, there's and plenty of these report, boxes right. to do at home. So and, that doesn't and get reported. So it doesn't get reported. So our numbers are skewed and it's just very difficult. We're relying on hospitalization rates and, you know, death rates, unfortunately, still. And, and that doesn't really give you, you know, a real definitive picture. So um, we, we could bring it up right now. One of the things that I'm hopeful for, I had not heard back your question um, um, from the person that manages the program, but we're hoping um, Joe Comerford is supporting um, more, more towns to be in the wastewater treatment um, program. So um, we're hoping to participate, you know, the South Deerfield um, sewer treatment plan to get tested. So we know, you know, we would monitor if yeah. there was going to be an infection. The it's only an innovative thing, tool. Right? right. It's just, a, it will just give trends. It doesn't give you the number of people sick because, you know, different people, stools shed different amounts of Viral load, Vi viral load. But so it you will can't... help with the detection of the right. certain variants and whatnot. So, so um, I had reached out because um, Trevor had a question on um, would we be obligated um, once it's no longer free? This would be free, obviously, right now. Um, would we be obligated to continue the testing? So um, at this point, I'm waiting for an answer back, but I believe not mm -hmm. from when I, from um, Elena, from Joe Comerford's office. Um, had indicated that nobody was concerned about that because that was not going to be a requirement. But I decided to ask the state to make sure. Okay. Did you ask DEP and DEP because some of these regulations come through DEP on our permit? No, this is all through the Department of Public Health. This has nothing to do with DEP. Okay, because that's that was a concern of the chief operator. Yeah. No, this is all, this is entirely. Time. DEP driven and DEP funded. DPH. I yeah. mean DPH. Well, it's, it Sorry. comes from the Centers of Disease Control at the federal level and working with partnerships at the national level to trickle it down to state and local uh, wastewater surveillance. Just another vital, uh, you know, innovative tool when it comes to uh, trying to control the spread of communicable disease with this kind of primary prevention uh, detection. Um, Diagnostic. So, yeah. what's the impact on um, what we're doing at the plants? How is this going to impact the it, it It's literally you 30 seconds to fill up a wastewater tube and send it out. I still want to see, like, before I'm 100% on what this is going to do, or the time the it takes to do it. I want to see what, what, the, what oh, the process is. To oh, yeah. how, you know, oh, no, how it it's fine. Time. It's, I know it's five seconds to dip it, but you still got to package it up, right. do the well, reporting, can, yep. get so it back. The so there's a lot more to it. We have made some transitions in our testing so that we can redeploy our personnel to do other work instead of testing. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm asking. That we question. have another team that does our testing now. So oh, instead well, of, it's not our guys. So I, I, let's just get all the info. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I know that there are. I know that there. I know that there are other towns uh, and municipalities that do this kind of uh, bio data, biobot um, data collection. So um, I can reach out to other towns as well and and, and provide some sort of like mini survey and, and relay it back to you guys. This isn't a question for. So it's a question for the sewer commissioners but it's really a functional operational question that needs to be discussed with the chief operator. So we'll ask, we'll talk. Because the impact doesn't happen with us, it happens with him. Yeah, so we'll do a mini survey and just gauge how Before it goes. Before anything yeah. starts. I, 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 ver I verified with both Greenfield and Amherst um, because they are participating at this in Northampton at this point. And they literally, it is like 30 seconds, you get an extra yeah. tube and you send it out the same. It's, yeah. But we're also down staff people. I know. 
We'll, if we pile too much on. I, that's my yeah. major concern. So we'll get all the data yeah. and figure out you know, who's paying I for will, it. I when. will find out that right. there is no obligation um, if it's no longer free, we don't have to continue it. That was a legitimate concern. And what it takes to do it and, and report. And what it takes to do it. Right. We need to know what the impact is on right. gas. I, yeah, I, but I, overall, I, it sounds like it's a good thing to do because if we're not doing testing in schools and we're not doing um, individual reporting and people are testing at home. This is one way you can find out what's going on in the community. And if there's a spike that's not showing up elsewhere, it's gonna be really valuable to have that information. And I can't imagine it's going to impact somebody's day longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> well, and it's going to be timed throughout the week. Maybe it'll be done once a week. Maybe it'll be done twice a week. Or, so I think we're over overestimating the impact on you know, the sewer staff. But that's just my two cents. So we'll just we'll get all the data. We'll yeah. figure out how much it's going to take. Process. And my, right. my question is the percentage. Like, what is it? what is it testing and how do I'm, this is all rear view mirror so we're we're knowing what's in the plant you know when we get the <laughs> test back it's already happened already so what i'm wondering is like the percentage of when we see a spike what does it mean like what what are the what are the data metrics like what like how far what, how much is telling is us it which is lucky for us because it has picks up both frontier and the deerfield elementary school is what it does is it gives you the viral load and then it will measure the surge, mm -hmm. a surge, but it also will give you the forecast when the surge is decreasing. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it get, why we want to start sooner than later once this money, you know, once this is approved. Um, obviously, we're, you know, we're, we'd be on a wait list at this point. But the, the point is that you would know what's happening. And it's... Right. right, and the and the lag it is in the rear view mirror, but the it, lag is like a day or two. So, which is a little bit better than the well, testing there, reporting through Maven as well, which is delayed through a number of days and whatnot for reporting purposes. And and also, and it's just not guide. accurate anymore because of so much right. home testing. So, yeah. and also, it would flag up asymptomatic people who don't even test because exactly. they're not ready, um, but it their body is going to excrete, uh, um, you know virus and it's going to show up right. and they might not be sick, but they might sicken someone else. So, and, and as to who's going to study the, the samples, well, that's, that's something that DPH is going to be doing. It, it's not right. going they to They have the contractor already. And, and I'm just curious, you know, what is it going to do for us? What do we implement? So you see a spike, right? You yeah, see it come down. Well, we get to see that. But, what do we but, do about it? So, so yeah, if you but see then we the can viral... warn the public that they need to be more cautious, and it and it gives us a data point. The problem is, Trevor, why why this is so difficult to talk about keeping the schools open and safe is because we don't have any data anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no data for us to, you know, kids are coming out sick, but we don't even know anymore right. that they are truly sick because half the people aren't even reporting that they are taking tests or the results of the test or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah. we have always said we're making our decisions based on data, Correct. but we have limited yeah. data now. And mm -hmm. so as a, as a primary prevention right. with public health, um, it, it's just one of those metrics that we see a spike happening. We can go ahead and come up with an advisory or come up with uh, you know, discussions with uh, key partnerships and, and stakeholders in the community and just let them know, please be aware, this is the guidance or this is, uh, this is what's the happening. recommendation right, right now from the Board of Health in order to protect the spread of communicable disease. Absolutely. I'm just wondering if it's much different than what we're seeing now. You know, I mean, no, I know it'll be right. a data point. I, get, I understand all this. I get it. I'm just wondering how much operationally different are we going to be? That's it when you know there's a spike or not a spike. I don't know. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things you might think about, Trevor, is that um, if you see a correlation between a lot of sick outs at school mm -hmm. and a spike in the sewer treatment plant, then you can say there might be a relationship here, you know, which you would want to explore. And then you yeah. might say, let's do testing at the school for a period of a week or two, mm -hmm. um, where you can then get your data point locally and Thankfully, this these variants seem to be milder, and that's a good thing. 
but um, doesn't mean that you know the switch can't turn and it go, goes the other way. So right. it's really um, you know unless it's really an onerous thing, and I can't imagine how it could be. Um, it's just a and and I could be proven wrong. I mean, we right. may find out it takes and, an hour for somebody. And that's what um, I'm asking. Just yeah. get on oh yeah, we app. should explore absolutely. And the good thing is that Greenfield's already doing this, and Amherst yeah, is already doing this. We're monitoring so. it already, so right. that's why I'm saying yeah, yeah, we've got some data locally. But um, okay, so let's let's hear that and see what see what happens. And you, we're waiting to find out if they fund it. Get on a list. Right. We don't. Right. I were mean, you also we're just into all I wanted to do was to indicate that we were interested because. If they have enough communities, they will put some money towards it so more communities could join. Were we also uh, looking at uh, pool testing? Because you said they're not doing pool testing. No, in the they're not doing anymore. pool testing. So that also, I don't know if it's on here. Um, what I wanted to do was, if it was all right with you um, and Tim, I wanted to make sure that um, the mayor of Greenfield is writing a letter to Desi to, to um, request pool testing continue so fall. i wanted to make sure that we deerfield were able to sign on as well if that if tim and and trevor you were i think it's an important tool i don't yeah i'd be curious to see i'd love to know from from um darius how it worked last i mean we did it all last year so how, how that did was it work? the only what did we do? that was the only indication we had right you know we, we were trying ones. to we were trying to narrow it down to we're not we're not doing anything school wide Correct. anymore. We were trying to narrow it down to classrooms. So by having pool testing, you could narrow it, the clusters down to specific, specific rooms. Meg, Meg specific Birch room. did a pretty good job. And then you and Meg yeah. Birch did a wonderful job. And what you did were you you would say if you had so for an example, this is an example. We could say if you had three cases or more in a classroom, then that class needs to mask for the next five days. Right. And what you were trying to do was narrow down your actions so you'd have mitigation of sorts and awareness. So mm -hmm. the parents, you know, there could have been a we're sibling aware. in that class that was, you know, had in the middle school or Correct. in a preschool. And yeah. the idea is you would then alert the, the you know the connectors so mm -hmm. that it wouldn't spread to the middle school or the preschool or something like that. Okay. Yeah, the, the parents would be alerted, some kind of alert thing and that's what what everybody is trying to come up with is but having pool testing being eliminated but um what we all feel um and darius has said the same thing the superintendent association feels the same thing whatever desi is saying now is not what necessarily is going desi going to be the week before school or right. two days before school so we shouldn't panic but it seems like we should be sending a letter that to, we're interested that we're we we in advocating for this pool testing to help help pressure them to reinstate that mm -hmm. i mean it seems like there's communities across the state are all doing that but um based on the discussion are groups asking for it, you mean? yes that based on the discussion groups that i participate in but you know are they writing letters i don't know you know are, mm -hmm. what are they doing to make that conveying that information so in our group, we decided, based on other conversations from, our, you know, the eastern part of the state, we would send this letter requesting pool testing as a group. Okay. And and so I just wanted to make sure you guys yeah, were okay about signing on. I mean, the more okay. tools we have, the better. All right. Well, yeah. that I mean, by eliminating that tool, I mean, we. How can you make database decisions when you have no data? You can. And, and how do you protect the kids? Right. And how can you protect the kids exactly? So it's. It's really important that we do some of these things. Lastly, not to beat COVID to death, which I'd like to. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think we're all sick is, of it. Uh, do we have any other vaccination dates coming up? Um, we just have the August 26th. Okay. That Alex had um, pre-scheduled already. Yep. And we're hoping that um, people will either come for boosters 
Yep. Um, kids can come for first shots. We'll make sure they get signed up for a second shot. Will that whatever. also be flu or is that too soon? No, now, that's Generally, too right about now, we start thinking about how many flu shots we're going to need we're, um, for the winter. That's a separate clinic, right? Yeah, that's going to yeah. be in the October, end of September, October. Yeah, but time generally, time. right about now, we're thinking with Lisa, how many cases we're going to, how many right. vaccines we're going to need. Have we right. started talking about that? We'll, we'll, we'll connect have. with... Um, we got a vendor doing that right yeah, now. Yeah. Um, FERCOG over the years, we front they fronted the money and right. bought it. And so what we're doing is just going through a vendor, just like we do for our clinics. Yeah, just, just kind of like the DPH uh, mobile vaccination unit, just an outside vendor providing the vaccinations. So we are up. not going to do an EDS drill. Oh, this we would year. do an EDS. We, we, we could we, do that. Yeah. yeah, we're doing it. Oh, yeah. We'll do a drive through still, yeah. but we won't purchase the. Right. We're not purchasing the vaccine. So um, the, so Walgreens would be providing that. Walgreens so or CVS. We would still set up an EDS with our volunteers, but Walgreens would not. Right. Just like they the would COVID just be vaccines. doing the yeah. shots and we would still have our other volunteers. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we've been doing. The That's whole what COVID. We did all are we going yeah. to be losing that capability of having those volunteers that do those shots? No, because are we, we signed up for that. We're, we already registered individually for the MIIS system. Yeah. What we're not doing is purchasing the vaccine ahead of time. Yeah. So um, Commonwealth Medicine, in order to come up with a reimbursement plan, um, in order to order vaccines, we just need to make sure that we can do that. And so we weren't able to do that for FY23. But for the next fiscal year, we should be able to uh, be prepared in that measure. And again, delegating out, this is not going to be a cost for the town uh, with this kind of in-kind uh, contribution um, from the it's Walgreens still will be organization. Free. I just, my fear was like, that was our biggest complaint is that we didn't use the EDS site. And I just didn't want that to disappear oh, okay. using Walgreens now. No, we're going to still do the EDS because right. they still because need we're still going to be doing again in the in the fall as well um, other vaccination. Programs. Yeah, we're so still we have we'll still have the Vax Plus come and stuff. It's just yeah, you know we're trying to get as many people um, done with COVID as possible. Right. I'm thinking flu, just yeah. like flu right. stuff, flu. like we typically yeah. do. Well, okay. No, we'll still do the EDS All right. because it's going to be a bad flu season based on what Australia right. has experienced. So usually what happens there happens up here. So okay. we'll, we want people to get as many flu shots as possible in people's arms. So uh, instead of just one EDS, we'll probably really run two or three just okay. because it's, you know, people will Keep be confused. Volunteers. People will be confused when they have covid you know, COVID and flu are similar, mm -hmm. you know, right. So we, we don't want anybody sick. So we're going to draw, try to do as much as possible. Okay. So moving on to discussion items, the mass DOT meeting update. So I was just going to update everybody, I guess, and everybody weigh in um, on the meeting. And so we, uh, last Friday, um, before Jim McGovern was here, we met with um, officials from district two mass DOT to kind of talk about a lot of the a lot of the things that we've been kind of hanging on to while COVID's been around for a couple of years that we, you know, we started a meeting with that group um, right before COVID and then had to kind of stop. Um, but we still have all these projects happening in town and we, you know, we get, I think the most things people reply to us on are sidewalks and conditions of roads. Like that's what you get when you're a select board member. So, um, so we had a good meeting and we, we really kind of listed out the items that are important to this town that we see. Um, I'll just kind of tick off a list. So it's, it's um, Sugarloaf Street, Park Street, Conway Street, which is, which is a state highway based, again, I say this all the time, but everybody knows this, hopefully, if not, um, the uh, before 116 bypass went through, the um, once Sugarloaf Street was a state highway, it is still a state highway. So all the sidewalks, all the infrastructure, the drainage, except for the sewer system and the water system is, is town owned. Um, the water system is district owned, but town owned uh, for the sewer. So we discussed um, the interest in the town taking over 
those roads and the the interest on behalf of DOT to not own them anymore. Those roads are really they view them as a downtown, a town owned kind of thing because it's no longer really a state highway. And this road is there's a dead end here. So um, so we thought uh, about taking them over so that we could do a lot of the improvements that we want to do to our downtown. However, we're not interested in taking them over until the infrastructure is done. So, you know, they were thinking, oh, well, we just resurfaced and we'll maybe resurface a little more and, no. you know, then you can take them over. And we said, no, that's not it. We want you to do a full evaluation of the sewer, I mean, of the uh, drainage and all the infrastructure and you know, all of it really needs to be brought up to speed and then we would take it over. That's a big dollar item. They don't really have the money or time or interest in doing that at the moment. So we're kind of in a bit of a standstill. However, we did press them on the sidewalks. They are already doing the ADA um, accessibility to the sidewalks on a lot of the roads. There's several more to do. Um, so that's in the plan. And then we've kind of pushed them on, well, let's do the sidewalks and the spots between that you've just done. Um, you know, it's cement uh, or asphalt over cement right now. So it's a, it's, a, it's a mess and everybody knows what a mess it is. But I think they're moving forward with that and they, you know, they, they are hoping to um, come back to us and meet with us. We gave them a lot to think about, and I'll go into more, but gave them a lot to think about. So they're, they're mulling that stuff over and coming back to, to us with some answers on what they can do. And I think finishing out those sidewalks will be a big part of that and might be something that we can get sooner rather than later. Um, taking over the roads would be a long, long term. It's a long term process, even if they were up to speed. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done there. The second part of this was parking on those streets. Um, they do not want any parking um, on Sugarloaf Street. They've just done the bike lanes when churches have service. One church really doesn't have much space for parking. The other had sufficient space for parking, but people tend to park on the streets. We ask that people don't park on the street. Um, they have not enforced it. We have not been out writing tickets. They have not enforced it because they understand, again, it is more of a town road than it is a state road, but it is still a state road. And they encourage us not to put parking spots on it and not to be parking on it, especially with the bike lanes. As people are parking on Sugarloaf Street now um, and the bikes are trying to come through, it really is not a safe situation. So we ask if at all possible, find, find parking off of Sugarloaf Street. Um, the next item was the town common. The town had, um, had uh, agreed to put money towards redoing the common. We laid that, plane, uh, that plan out to them with the positions of crosswalks. They have some concerns on them. Um, I met Friday, as I said, with, with um, a Berkshire Design and the town committee group, uh, common group, and they are, um, so we will start the permitting process and that will kind of get the input of DOT on the crosswalks. They may have to do some work to the roads and add some bump outs. They really are interested in slowing down the traffic through town, through Park Street. People zip up Sugarloaf and blow right through Park and right on to North Main. They are maybe interested in changing that to maybe come to a stop. Um, so they're looking at how to calm down the traffic. The, their other main concern is the length of the crosswalks in our plan. And that's just because the roads are so big. So they may have to add some bump outs. So there's a lot of discussion going on about how those work. We may have to change the design of the common based on their input on how the crosswalks are and how long they are and where they are. So that that's all gonna get done in the permitting process and it's begun to try and figure that out. Another item we talked about was the dry bridge, um, which is really the bridge at north end of North Main Street that goes up over the railroad tracks. D again, for background and history, DOT was had 90% drawings done on that. The town backed out of that process, um, which infuriated DOT because they spent a lot of money and time and takings to kind of do all of that. Um, then we kind of pulled the rug out from under them years ago, but for whatever reason and we're back at asking the 90s. them yep yeah, it was in the early 90s before any of us but we're all so we we're kind of hat in hand saying can you please get this back on the what's called a tiff just to get a bridge number and get it going and they're you know 
they kind of gave us the same answer they gave us a couple years ago, which was like, yeah, we'll look at it, but you know, it, it, it's really the town shot itself in the foot by not doing it when, when we did it. Now it's got to be wider, taking more land because of the way the codes are for sidewalks on both sides of the bridge and all. So anyways, we're, we're trying to get that moving. We talked about um, Stillwater Bridge, which is on the list. It's a town bridge that they are going to pay for and do, and, and it will have a one-way traffic. Carolyn was very instrumental in pushing that forward and making sure that we had access for our farmers and our emergency vehicles uh, to not, you know, uh, cut off that whole end of town. Um, so that that's successful and it's moving forward. So thank you for that. So a lot, <laughs> that was a lot years of years and years of work, 10 years probably on that. So more than um, that, I think, but probably it just was hard to get, get it on the list. And yep. then, but they put extra money in because of course it's more expensive. So yep. that was really nice. Tim, do you want to add anything to the meeting or? No, I, I just want to second that I was encouraged um, in our discussion about sidewalks because you're right, you know, sidewalks are loom large in everyone's legend. And, um, that when we brought up and 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 mentioned that look you you know you built these wonderful sidewalks on Route Five where nobody lives, and yeah. we'd really love to see the same sidewalks along Sugarloaf Street where people do live and we have a senior, and they seemed to be receptive and they said, they did. well yeah that might be something we could uh, find some money for. So yes. when they say we might be able to find some money, that's encouraging. <laughs> It is, it is. And, and, and from what Jim McGovern said, a lot of times with DOT, if the project isn't big enough, it's not worth their permitting and mobilization. And it's got to be a big enough project to really get on their radar. If it's a small little thing, it's very hard for them to kind of get involved with. So we can make it large. <laughs> There's plenty to do. So hopefully <laughs> uh, they will get through some of that. You know, again, the small like sidewalk things, they tie them into other other projects are doing so hopefully we can get something going there um we and i think that was a pretty much it for that meeting so i felt really positive yep. though that they were listening to us because yes they started out with not willing to talk about the infrastructure and underground and yep. by the end they were inter they you know they were willing to at least come out investigate and yeah, to see what's there see what's there right, right. and, so that's and scoping i think they talked about doing camera work and Yes. Yeah. So that's yes. all good. It was pretty concrete considering yeah. we've been meeting on this for a while. And it was great to have Kevin Scarborough there too to kind of bring up his knowledge of, you know, the sinkholes when sewer do uh, when the drainage does go, you could lose a bus in. I mean, he saw, you know, he brought up a two examples of, you know, they were thinking, oh, the infrastructure is fine, but I think when they run a camera down, they're going to realize that there's some some work to do there. So so that was good. Um, next item is transfers. We have got do we have any that we have two that we want we have to do two transfers between appropriations the yep. select board needs to approve so the first one is um a transfer amount requested of fifteen thousand uh will be transferred from the general highway payroll to the um town buildings miscellaneous repairs and that is to cover the unanticipated repair costs for the senior center building and for some elevator work at the library i guess um yes. The, uh, you know, we had the radiator leak at the senior center or the 1888 building as we're calling it now. Um, so that was a whole lot more money than we expected because it leaked again after we got everything done. So, um, so that, so that again, that's one. And I don't know if we want to just take a vote on that right now. Um, I will make that motion to approve the transfer of $15,000 as requested. And I'll second it. Thank you. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay, that one's done. And then the second one is between accounts is um, $1,100 being um, transferred from the building inspector ex inspection expense account, and it's moving to the town office expense account. And this is covering unanticipated expense related to land use hearings. We've had quite a bit of work going on on that. I so. will make that motion. Carolyn, eleven $1 hundred dollars. We have a second, Tim. I'll second it. Thank you. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn S, aye. We'll sign these, and then when you're in, Tim, and yeah, I'll come in tomorrow, mask, mask up, and sign it all. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, 
So that is done. The, um, the next is uh, PVPC technical assistance contract with review and approval. Can you help me with that? I think Anna Lee can help us Anna with Lee. that. So they, we split services. So go ahead, Anna Lee, talk. Hi, Anna Lee. Yes, um, as you recall, uh, with our budgeting process, uh, we have been approved to have approximately $11,000 in the um, planning budget for <clears throat> planner assistance uh, that would be for the planning board, potentially also some for the ZBA and the Conservation Commission. Um, initially, we were anticipating that all of this would be for assistance through PVPC, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, but we have since learned that um, FERCOG might be able to help us um, <clears throat> with some, and FERCOG is actually our, um, our agency of choice since it's Franklin County. Um, however, um, since we would be using working with both of them, we're not quite ready to discuss the FERCOG contract with you tonight, but um, okay. we do have the draft of the um, Pioneer Valley uh, of a contract with Pioneer Valley Planning Association. It's gone through Lisa. Um, we have discussed the um, actually fairly limited scope of services with Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission that essentially um, they would be helping with um, initial review of um, site plan review applications, uh, special permits, similar applications such as that, um, uh, attending the public hearings, um, helping us with preparing conditions and then helping us with writing up the decisions. Um, and then, you know, there's that general piece of um, other assistance as requested. Um, mm -hmm. But again, um, primarily FERCOG would be our, our agency of first, first choice, but um, we did have the planner meet with the planning board uh, this Monday. He um, it was a very good meeting. And so we do hope that you can um, sign the sign the contract and we can move forward. Yeah, and I think I think FERCOG, again, is your first choice, ours too. I talked to Linda uh, Dunleavy about this and I know she's been talking with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, kind of what's going on originally. And um, and, and it's just really that the, they're transitioning through staff as well. And so everybody's just trying to pitch in and figure out what we can do to get coverage in the meantime. And um, So thank you for, for doing that work. I Is there a fee structure along with this? Is there a dollar amount we're approving or? Well, there is an hourly amount for the, um, an hourly amount for the, um, for the consultant, um, but we'll be obviously watching it as we <laughs> rack up our invoices between FERCOG and uh, PBPC so that we stay within our budgeted amount. It's $100 an hour, I believe. Not to exceed eleven thousand, right? Right, that uh, was the, the total yeah. amount. I, I would make a motion to um, sign this contract, and I'd second it. Um, I assume that we're saying that Trevor, the the chair, can sign for us. Yes. Yes. Yep. It looks like yep. Well, then one I, signature. Yeah. Here. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Then I will just amend my uh, motion to include the um, chair sign the contract for us. And I'll second that that amendment. Great. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McCann, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your work on this too, Annalee. Mm -hmm. It was good oh, to have Casey support. also. And Casey. Um, Annalee, so this, um, Casey had given us a list of stuff that you were trying to do. Um, this is very aggressive. Yes, yes. When I was talking with Peggy Sloan, who is the planner at FERCOG, she says, oh, that's a, a good three or four year plan. <laughs> yes, so I was just looking at this, I was thinking, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I, you guys have been actually, you know, all you ladies have been working so hard. But I have to say that, yeah, um, this is this is much. Um, this is right. <laughs> Our first, our first, our first plan will be to prioritize <laughs> yeah, see what we can do. I, I think what's going to happen, or you, you know, uh, the one way to do this, just from my past experience, is just to create subcommittees of people that are interested, and it doesn't have to be just planning board. You can get, you know, some other volunteers in the community oh, to work with yes. one or two. You don't, if you have a subcommittee or a work group task force, 
um, two people are not a quorum. So you could have two planning board meet people that would chair, you know, or be on a subcommittee, and then you could have two or three other people from the community help. And you actually mm -hmm. might um, I get a lot more of this stuff done on the list rather than doing everything. Excellent. Stuff. That's a good idea. Yes, yeah, so we've got a nice work group going with represent on, on our accessory apartment bylaw with representatives from ZBA, uh, finance committee, um, select board, as you well know. So, um, and, and it's being chaired by one of our planning board uh, members, Kathy Sylvester. So um, trying to spread the wealth, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. That seems to work pretty well that you know, it's good yeah. structure. Good reminder. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next item, oh, we just, I guess, the FERCOG technical assistance contract, we're going to wait and so hold on that. You right? should hold yeah. on that. Correct. We'll circle back, we'll come around back once on that. We have a okay. Contract. Sounds good. Um, Eliza's watch for opioid funding. I would love to speak to this a little bit. Um, uh, Dan Harper reached out to me and maybe you as well and others. I don't know if Tim Tim got in there. Um, so Dan Harper lost Eliza, um, his daughter, to opioid uh, overdose um, several years back, and um, devastating, right? You know, and and so many people across the country and the state and everywhere are dealing with, you know, the the fallout from opioids um, and overdoses and trying to come up with ways to battle the disease, you know, battle the stigma, um, addiction. addiction. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember a few years back when I first started, I think there was a, um, the opioid task force met here and I just shared my stories of, you know, being in a lot of pain over the many years from motorcycle accidents and, you know, the different medicines that I had been stuck on and am on to this day and um, you know and, and easily can see how people kind of gravitate towards um, you know street drugs and the just the devastating fentanyl issue that's going on and yeah, sure. laced in just about everything out there right now it's crazy um, so um, we had, as Deerfield, as many other towns, signed on to the um, class action lawsuit, and I'm drawing a blank on the name of the company. It was a family company who, you know, produced all of the opioid. Sackler and, family. What was that again? I think the Sackler family. Sackler family, yes, who, you know, just promoted no problem with morphine or, you know, Parker, I can't remember the name of the drug either, but there was one specific drug that they, that they just told that, you know, all the doctors that, you know, no side effects, no, you know, just, but it got everybody hooked. It, you know, you sprained your ankle and everybody thought this was a wonder drug, no side effects, you don't get addicted. And, you know, you had everybody and their brother getting addicted to opioids. And then when, people finally realized what was going on and started cutting people off, you gravitate towards the street drugs because you are so sick from the overdose, or not from the overdose, from the withdrawals. And um, they're horrendous. It's the worst thing you can feel. And people want to do anything they can not to feel that. And it's not like they're trying to get high all the time. They're trying to not be sick and throw up and hurt in every inch of their body and through their bones it's it's brutal and um and then because of all the fentanyl and just taking too much of it your body just has to keep having more and more and more um you overdose and luckily now we have narcan which is amazing and helps people come off of you know you can save somebody quick enough so dan is pretty brilliant and he Obviously, when you lose a child, you'll do anything to try and fix that. And uh, I think he he really put his mind to finding a way to get help to the people that are overdosing, because really, they don't they can't tell. All of a sudden, they're out, and um, if nobody's there to get them up or 
hit it with Narcan, they're gone. And that's why we lose so many people across the country. So the money that has come to us, which is small potatoes, um, I mean, it's massive throughout the country, but to Deerfield, we'll, we'll get maybe 30,000 over six years or more. And, um, and so we had talked about, well, what do we do with the money when it comes in? How can we help? You know, we, we talk about making sure that, you know, we have Narcan on, on hand, any expense that we've had would go, you know, we make sure that we're stocked up to, to fight this. But what Dan has um, developed is, is called Eliza's watch. And you can envision this like a Fitbit. It's a watch that's on your wrist and, you know, it's always on you. And, um, when you're using and you're afraid you're going to overdose because they're aware it can happen. It's not like you don't know. Um, they turn it on, uh, hit a button, and it's programmed in there with phone calls to EMS, to their family members, to people who are close to them. Um, and if they stop moving in 30 seconds, um, it can tell your heartbeat. You know, it can tell that you are you are not moving. And so it can set out a, a, a loud alarm to get your attention or to get somebody's attention around you. Um, and if it goes, I think a minute without uh, movement, it, it will send out an emergency. It's kind of like I fall and I can't get up. It, it sends a, a message to pre-programmed EMS or police or your, so somebody can get to you fast and get you with Narcan to keep you alive. And he's been looking at ways to make this happen, working with different entities to make it happen. The problem is, is that everyone's like, oh, there's an app on your iPhone. Why don't you get an iWatch? You can put it. If you're on opioids and you're stealing everything you can to get, to get the next fix so you're not sick all the time, you're going to hawk that iWatch in a second. You're going to hawk a phone, you're going to hawk anything you can to get a fix. He's making these so inexpensive that here's your Narcan, here's your Eliza's watch. Um, they're so cheap and plentiful that it's not worth stealing. It's not worth selling. It's not, you know, it's something you're, you're going to want to keep on you to save your life. And um, so this, he's looking, he's talking with the governor, very excited about it. He's talking with state entities, this is this is not enough money to get anything off the ground that we're getting but i was talking with him about trying to talk with other communities the state the feds there's money to be to be put together it does it's not a lot of money but it would be enough to get started to you know first do the the um first batch of of watches um i think 20,000 or something like that he was trying to get get this up and running and i think it's just an amazing program it's locally based um he's not looking for profit you know I, and i asked him I'm, and, and i guess it really depends we need to look into if we wanted to put some of our money when we get it towards this again i don't know if it's enough or time or anything like that or if we want to but i didn't know if, it, if it's a for-profit or a non-profit how does that work with a town kind of doing that kind of thing so it's more just I wanted people aware of it, and um, we don't have any money yet. I, there's a lot to a go through bit. when we get it, but just wanted to say that this would be um, something that I would think would be a great use of our money if it's any help to anybody. And um, it seems like an amazing program that would really uh, change, you know, save a life. Um, so. That's what I know so far, and we'll kind of report back after. But I thought it was a really great program, and it's a you know it'd be a brilliant. It'll be a great way to, you know, to help Dan, you know, and and Elijah's watch program. So yeah, that's it. We um, could write a letter of support yep. to the governor. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think because there's you know as I talk to him, he doesn't really understand politics. He said he's like, look, I'm just I talked with them and they said, hey, there's all this money going to your local community. So he he knew me, so he got a hold of me. But I think I would love to see other communities that have signed on kind of pool the money together. Maybe it's something FERCOG could put together to 
pool money together to do it or the state like there's going to be so much money i said look springfield alone could fund your program i mean that with the money that would go to that it's just such a great plan and everybody that's heard it is, is all on board but you can't make it too expensive it's got to be a cheap thing so yeah well I, I mean it seems like that would be um we should write a letter of support to the governor but we should also send a letter to the mma you know, yes. the mma to get the great towns, idea towns together right um and if we and, put a little portion together right. it'd be enough he doesn't need a lot and right. um just to get it off the ground right. and i'm sure somebody else you know but that's how you yeah i mean you got to use your networks to pull people together yeah so um i i seem like if we could get a letter that's a good uh, idea um thank you we could do that yep okay i love that mma it that's, just, a, per, that's just a better start. idea it's just a start but, exactly but all you need is a core group that's right and if we bring a core group and we can get you know a couple other counties yeah. together just through our networks towns are going to yeah. want to find a way to help yeah. and this seems like such well, an amazing you know, way to help andy we can talk to andy out from williamsburg and yeah i mean williamstown and yeah pull his group together and right you know you only need a couple that's right and then we talk to approach the governor yep i think it's great so i'd love to help help with that um franklin conservation district support letter for yard to yard grant so, yard, yard by yard oh yard by yard yeah um so this is, this is off of our climate forum where we were you know we had through our mvp program we had done the soil health um baseline yeah and um Uh, yeah. Fine. Yep. Okay. We should just change a couple of things. Yeah. Um, what we did is we did through the MVP program, we got a, a soil health um, baseline for the town. And we had kids um, from Frontier go over to Galinsky's. Galinsky Farm was absolutely wonderful and let the kids do the soil testing mm -hmm. and participate and understand the whole concept of healthy soils, which is your root systems being in the ground to absorb water when you have high frequent intense events, and then also um, release water when you have this like drought kind of situation. So the kids had um, through Frontiers classes had this huge um, opportunity to participate with our healthy soils baseline, thankfully from they just walked over to Galinsky's farm. So it was wonderful. And the, the idea here is you're trying out of our climate forum is to do actual implementation and to get people feel um, involved and being able to handle or be feeling like they are promoting, you know, um, in the right direction, climate change. It it's came clear to me through COVID that you know, teens are very depressed with social media, isolation of COVID, but then also climate change is really depressing them. So this is the idea here is from a mental health point of view, from a climate change point of view, is to what can you do just like recycling? This is, you can do this in your yard. And we um, sent a letter of intent to the, um, the Franklin Conservation um, um, district, which I chair, we sent a letter to EEOA and asked, you know, said that this is what we'd like to do. And they sent us uh, back and said, send a full proposal. We are very interested. And usually that means that they will fund it. So the idea is um, a Leiden, um, hopefully Charlemont and us will participate in this program where we are uh, literally buying plants, um, hiring a consultant to consult with people. This is really a focus on the Bloody Brook, especially that area. Um, and also um, a municipal pro project that would be 100% done by the grant and including training to the highway department on how to manage um, lawn care, you know, regular mowing, traditional mowing um, into a meadow that of native plants, which would be a savings to our highway department and, uh, and maintenance, but would be such an environmental help 
as well. Do you, so, do you have a parcel in mind yet? Well, when I talked to Kevin, because I obviously wanted to check with Kevin if he was interested, because there is a commitment of training time that, mm -hmm. you know, our highway department would have, you know, a couple hours of training. It's not huge training, but it's like, how would you manage a meadow versus just going out and mow? Um, and being of interest in the Bloody Brook watershed, we were thinking of the Rura lot at the end of the hut. At I was the end just of, thinking that yeah. too, at the end of that um, road. But there's also some of the cemeteries that we maintain, like, especially like, I can think of the one off a of upper road. There's a big meadow next to that mm -hmm. cemetery that we mow. And, and that is a savings if we switch it to this native, you know, species. And the idea is that you would have better roots mm -hmm. and pollen, you know, would be better for pollinators. You know, it's, it's just all around how great you, thing. How do you, cause like we battle with bittersweet so bad. How do you figure we'll, like, do you think it's just going to get taken over by? No, this? no, that's the whole point. You use native. That's why we we'd have a we would subcontract with there. I'm I'm blanking on his name. This is really okay. embarrassing. But it's Owen, whatever. He's like mm -hmm. the guru for this whole movement. Okay, and he's actually local. And he's, you know, we would have public meetings, and he would work with us with the public in general, and then. Obviously, we only have like 35 people we could do, but we would raffle off plants for 35 residents. Mm -hmm. We would, you know, raffle off books. We were going to buy some books of his. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then we would have these public meetings. And the idea is it's an educational thing, but it's also something, a follow-up from this healthy soils mm -hmm. class that they had that kids could do at home in their own yards. And, you know, whether it's small, or, you know, acres, you know, a lot of people have little yards, but then there's, you know, people that have acres that we could switch over. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to suck up some of this water in, the, in Deerfield um, where the water table has risen, but also just give an implementation, an actual action plan for people to do. And because it's run through the conservation district case, there's no reporting for Casey. There's no staff time the our commitment is to have we have to have a public space to have you know educational meetings so couple, that is a staff time impact yeah. we would just have to coordinate that right mm -hmm. and then you know there's a couple hours of training that we would be giving to the highway department as part of this because you want maintenance of i mean you just don't want to we don't want to invest into you know the rural lot and replant it and then just and have, have it, all it taken done. over by yeah, or right. die or taken over by right. bittersweet. And that is would be one of the things that you would train for is, you know, how do you keep bittersweet and sumac out? Well, you know, so there's, you know, a couple things like that. It's not that there's no maintenance. It's There is maintenance, but it's just at a reduced level. So you're not out there mowing and, you know, whatever. You're, you're doing more things that are better. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not an expert. Yeah, I, no, I'd love to learn more about it because it, it, it's I just, just part want to make of this sure we don't wind up. We got, unfortunately, because the governor dragged his feet on this, the state hasn't implemented its soil health policy, which is, I'm on that subcommittee and we're meeting next week is really our only our second meeting, but we're trying to implement it and get it going on the state level. And hopefully our, what we've done is just going to mesh into it and it will allow us to do more things in town through the state, mm -hmm. through state like MVP or whatever, right. different programs. But um, because we're out ahead, we're one of the only communities that have a soil health baseline. Um, we, we have this opportunity for a grant. And of course, if you do it with a couple towns, it's more- Regionally. Yep. Right, so- Okay. Um, Kim? Kathy DeMeo had just got elected up in Leiden. And so her husband is on the conservation commission. So that seemed like a logical pro, you know, pro interested community. And mm -hmm. of course I've been talking to Marguerite Willis about educational funding back and forth. Yeah. So in the conversation, I said, would you be interested? And she was like, heck yes. She's trying to save money for the highway department up there. So yeah. um, we're, it's, it's always better to have a couple communities. So it looks like, 
we have a West County and North County and a South County. So town and they, the state yeah. looks like they're going to fund it. So that's where we're coming from. Do you have any so, thoughts on that, Tim? Um, I'm just trying to, the action we're going to do tonight is what, approve a letter? Yes. Yeah, it's just a letter saying yep. that we that the town is willing to be the recipient of this grant. <laughs> right. Um, so if they gave us the money, I mean, it's not 100 percent, but they said that they would they were very interested. Well, I'm I'm, you know, certainly interested in the idea that um, if you can cut mowing a property from you know, 20 times during the season to two, mm -hmm. um, you're going to save fuel, you're going to save time, you're going to be able to focus on other projects that are more useful to the town than mowing a field. Um, so I'm certainly in favor of giving it a shot. And uh, if there's money to be had and doesn't cost our staff time, other than some training, um, which I'm, I'm in favor of, you know, approving writing this letter. Okay. Do we need a motion or anything? Yes. Okay. I will make the motion to support the Franklin Conservation District um, in their attempt to obtain money for um, a yard by yard program to support our yard by yard program here in Deerfield. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Oh, wait, did, this was the old one, right? Yeah, I think this was the old one. That's yeah, you didn't move Perry. the sticky, right? No, I okay, didn't. good. <laughs> Just want to make sure I'll leave this. Okay. So Tim will need to come in and sign yeah. that. Yeah, he's got a couple others there too. Yep. Okay, so um, F, um, FSI appraisal, Hamshaw Lumber. That's pretty much Tim's, but I do know that I will be talking to the surveyor about getting in there. Okay. Go ahead, Tim. So um, as a part of the conversation with Doug Hamshaw about getting the survey done, which I believe Harold Eaton is in the process of working into its schedule. Is that correct, Casey? Yes. Yes. Um, I knew that we also needed an appraisal of the properties so that we could value the pieces of land to be swapped. So I reached out to a couple of companies uh, and one of whom said, well, we don't do that kind of work, um, but you should try FSI. And that was the other company I'd identified um, there out of uh, Northampton. <clears throat> so I contacted person and Casey is in, was looped in on this just so that uh, she'd be the one having to deal with any contracts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, he's agreed to provide services once we get the uh, survey done um, so that we can keep moving forward on this uh, tie in land swap to the get the Leary lot up and running. Uh, Thank you. I think Thank he you for doing this work, Tim. He estimated that it would be probably eighteen hundred dollars to do the survey. Um, it, the conversation I haven't had um, to nail it down is Doug Hamshaw agreed to well he suggested that the town split the survey costs uh, implicit in this process of course is there's an appraisal component, um, but that's one thing that I haven't nailed down with him about Hamshaw's willingness to pay 900 or whatever it is of the, of the appraisal cost. But one way or another, we need an appraisal. So um, this just sets us up. Um, now, Casey, did you, did you actually get um, a proposal from, from Gary Aldrich? No, I have not. Okay. I think um, verbally he said that it, it would be about $1,800, um, but that okay. once we get the appraisal, uh, the survey results, then we can right. nail it you down. You know what, what we're looking at in terms of the survey out, um, the survey details. Yeah. And I provided him and Casey with what I hoped was a semi accurate depiction of the narrow strip of land that we want to link. Uh, Elm Street to the Leary lot property, and then the sort of squarish portion of land that we would swap in the back of the, the Leary lot property for, for that strip. 
Um, and my calculations were that um, one area is about 5,100 square feet and the other area, the narrower strip, assuming it's a 30 foot frontage that we're talking about, it's about 4,600 square feet. So they're in the ballpark of being the same size. I did provide that to, uh, to Casey as well. So we're, we're basically um, the latest that I, I believe I understood from Casey and, and uh, was that Harold Eaton was hoping to fit this survey in in the next week or two. Is that accurate? I'm hoping to get out next week. I, can, I have a call in to confirm when he can do that though. Is Hampshaw read in on the dimensions that you just mentioned, Tim? In other words, did they give that to Randy or am I supposed to give that to Randy? I, I sent a, I, I went into the town um, assessor's office, took a picture of the, the, the plots that were in play. And um, then I drew lines to show. And I, and I think I shared this with, with you, but um, yeah, I'm, I have it. I just wonder, I, we probably should send that to Randy just for informational purposes at Harold Eaton Associates. Okay. Yeah. If, if, you have a contact with him would you do that or thank you okay okay um we have a um there was a request for a sewer abatement I, this is different than the one i thought about do you, is jen on hey there hi i have a little note you may have more information on the abatement is this, this isn't the one I sent you today. No, the one no, you, the one you sent me yesterday. You just said you were sending so that it would make you have a reminder. This yeah. is yeah. This is different for that second one. We needed no we needed correct. Yeah, and I I just wanted to have it in my mind to talk about. I didn't realize about. I hadn't looked at this one yet. Um, okay. This go ahead. You want to give any info on this one? Sure. So um, Alice came in and she told me that. She has, uh, an, oh, I wrote it down here, a 14 unit apartment building. Yep. And the uh, one of the young residents in one of the one bedroom units moved in and she the toilet was working fine. And then the toilet was making loud noises and she didn't report anything. <laughs> so a gasket was broken and they didn't realize that until they went and serviced all of the apartments and realized that it was her apartment that gasket was it was just continuously running right so they fixed it her son is a plumber and he actually replaced all 14 units all the all the gaskets on all the toilets so this wouldn't happen again we wouldn't, wouldn't get a big bill right um, so um i did talk to her this evening because she didn't complete the second sheet of um the yep. form for abatement. So I didn't know what she wanted as an abatement amount because she didn't write it. And so right. she doesn't even know what to ask. She just knows that it's astronomical and yeah. you know wanted some sort of forgiveness for a portion of it. Yeah, and I we typically try to help a little bit, especially if there's a problem, a leak, this and that. And then we try to be fair because we've had to treat all of that water. It's not like it... You know, went into the ground somewhere. It went through our system. So um, she understands that as well. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm sure. Um, I don't. Why don't we just put this on the next agenda, maybe, and um, that way it gives us time to kind of think it over this week and kind of. I, I know you've done some calculations already on like average of five bills, and that's typically what we do. We look at the average of what was going on there and try to find some happy medium to that. I mean, and when I spoke to her, I mean, the thing is, is that the average of the five bills doesn't always, and I said this to her, wouldn't necessarily give an accurate view because we don't know how many people were living there and how many apartments were um, full or- Right, because it's the whole and, building. Right, so, you know, so that's why I was like, well, maybe it was like using the last bill. So that's why I did a couple different calculations, not knowing what the board has done before and what you would yep. want to do, but- um, I also told her there was a good possibility that you would, you know, put this on the table for the next meeting. So yeah. however bills are due 
before the next oh meeting. yes no she needs to pay the bill because that's always what happens yeah anybody pays the bill and then a, an abatement is always in the back back end we send it okay. back to them so yeah they have to pay the bill first or else there won't be an abatement and then and then we give an abatement after if we find there's sufficient grounds for it okay, okay. i'll let her know that tomorrow yep and then uh, we'll try to make a decision for the next time yeah yeah we usually um usually come up with a proposal yeah and then we yep um, and then we discuss it and then um yeah try to find some help there's another similar one that's the one i sent you there's one similar from to this where I think it was at Snowberry Circle that that okay. they went away and the toilet was running the whole time that they were gone, and came back and realized it and you know so they have a massive bill as well and again we treat the water, but it's you know we try to be fair about it and. Um, so. um, just for educational purposes, when you say the last five bills, these bills are issued quarterly, semi-annually. Uh -huh. Semi annually, Semi -annual. twice a year. Yep. So we're talking about five, six month periods that we're going to look at in order to determine what was the aberration. Yes, and we we try to do that too. And then it's 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 very hard because a lot of times, um, like Snowberry Circle, there won't be five. You know, that that's fairly new building. Right. So so we really just we try to come up with something that's fair and and and. Um, no one's ever happy with, mm -hmm. with all of it, but but we just right. try to be fair about it. Yeah, we do. We try to take as much look back as we can, and then yeah, to evaluate. Go well, on. in the case of Snowberry, if they've been there for three years, at least it's a single unit, as right. opposed to a multifamily like this nineteen-unit yes. building. Um, Fourteen, yeah. Yep. It's difficult to say if if five apartments are empty for, you know, a year, and then. They come for an abatement when all when the buildings are all full. Well, you park, you know, it's it's a it complicates things. So yeah, it does. But this sounds like an obvious problem, and we certainly want to help. Yeah, we do. We do want to help, and I, and we have yeah. In the past, we've had these issues too, where there's no there's no usage in the past, or there's you know a, a drop off of several months or several years or something like that, but. Mm -hmm. so we'll we'll dig into that and sometimes it takes us a couple of meetings to get it right but we'll we'll work on that for sure and i'll try to get some other data from the other client and then they'll have to pay that they as well to, so they need to submit the application with a copy of their bill okay and they should indicate what they're asking for that that's kind of right. the issue with this one is there was real no indication of what right. they were looking for so yep yep we can do that so i'll, I'll reply back to that um, Thanks, Jen. That person as well. So I'm just going to keep it in the folder here. Yep. And Trevor, just did I understand you correctly? We're we basically don't process an abatement until the bill's paid. Correct. Right. Yep. They always have to pay the bill, and then we then we re, we abate back. Yep. Um, let's see. So that's the one. So we're going to work on this one. Okay. Um, Franklin County Sheriff's Office, we're going to pass over this at the moment, right? So or do you want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, the dog shelter services. Yep. That's pretty standard and that falls within the purview of the police department. I think for our population, it's an $800 fee. Um, this one's fairly routine. I don't know. I guess I haven't seen this contract for a while. It was, yeah. if it's working on a three-year cycle, it probably started before I came back to town. And, well, we never did this at all. Uh, no, in the beginning, we did this. We used ago. to yeah. do this before, I, I, Colleen? Yeah. We, um, I was yeah. in this group that formed oh. this. Oh, right. no kidding. Right. Okay. Yeah, I don't ever remember it in my it time here. It was a long time ago. Yeah. And then, um, and then there's okay, the so memorandum is, of understanding. But the problem is, this is just a dog shelter agreement. Correct. It's not, you know, our police officers would still have to go up there and drop off the dog. And well, there's mm -hmm. so there's two different things. Yes. There's the shelter agreement. Or there's the shelter services agreement, and then there's the master the master agreement. Is I forget what they call it. Master kennel contract, I guess. Um, so there's two different contracts here. 
And I just, there was some clarifying, there was a clarifying email from one of the representatives right. about this. Um, and so, you know, you've also got the regional dog control services, which is separate. So I just- Can we just talk to Chief when- Yeah, I was just gonna say- um, This is for really us to start the review process. Yeah, we're, okay. Because I, what I don't remember, it looks like there was, so the last contract would have been July 1st. So it was a July 1st contract. So we'll have to circle back around to it as soon as we can. It wasn't the contract with them though, right? No, we haven't had a contract with them, at least in my time. We, were, we just had the we've other had, contract. We've been sharing with, uh, with Montague and Greenfield it's um, since at least eight years, I think. Yeah. Probably it's more, more like than 10. that. Yeah. yeah. It's more like 10. Yep. Okay. So it might be helpful if we have a conversation, if I have yeah, a conversation for sure. with um, Chief Pachurik. And, okay. Because this is one of those things that's under his purview. Yes. Okay. So we're going to hold on that until I can yep. talk to Don. Sounds good. Well, we what we all have to do is do more research on what we're going to do. Yeah. So. Um, so we have uh, appointments, resignations. You have interim town. Clerk? We do. We have... So I wrote you a memo. Oh, let me get you the memo. So we got we got quite a response to our vacancy. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very, it's a very. Um, Which one are we looking at here? Oh, so oh. interim town clerk is the first is in the in your packet. Oh, okay. It's flipped. The first item. Um, yep. Interim town clerk. Um, we're still waiting for the home rule petition to be decided by the general court. Right. So in the meantime, the only way for us to start building capacity is to hire an interim clerk that can perform um, certainly the preparation and provide the accessibility that's now required through some of the statutory changes the legislature's made recently. So we need somebody um, who can step into that role fairly quickly. We got a lot of re resume responses and applications, um, but the successful candidate for your consideration is Carlene Hamlin. She comes from the town of South Hadley. She actually retired as their town clerk several months ago. Great. Um, she's familiar with the responsibilities of the clerk, including the elections changes and voting changes that are upcoming. And I think that makes her a unique candidate yeah. to assist the town. Um, oh. She's also successfully implemented changes in that department that helped create efficiencies when she was working in South Hadley. Well, I think that might eyes. be useful for us to bring in yes. for consideration as we move toward the permanent position. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm so it's this. our recommendation that the select board vote to hire Carlene Hamlin as the interim town clerk and authorize the town administrator to finalize the contract process because this is a temporary contract position, so which is the only way that we can- uh, I'll make that motion. <laughs> I'll second that motion. You don't, have to, like you don't have to finish. Third the motion. You don't have to finish, have yep. To finish. Uh, all those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Make sure she have... starts pretty soon. <laughs> Uh, and then the second one is the, the administrative assistant The second one is the administrative recommendation? assistant recommendation. Okay. So again, we had a staff group uh, that helped develop the vacancy notice and work through the questions for uh, interviews. And so we interviewed several candidates with solid backgrounds in administrative and office management, but we'd like to present Amy Hahn as the successful candidate for the position. Now recall, this is a be full-time benefited position budgeted at 40 hours per week. So this is not part-time like the other one. Um, Amy comes with a background of extensive administrative experience. She also owned her own business. So she has some, some understanding of the nuances of you know just private business on her own, but she's a volunteer for the Hatfield Historical Commission and their Community Preservation Commission. Committee, right. sorry. Yep. And she served on the Hatfield Historical Society. She's got a records management background coming from medical office mm -hmm. and um, solid familiarity with software and organizational skills, which we think we can utilize to increase some efficiencies in the office. Great. So our recommendation is that the um, select board approve the hire of Amy Hahn for this position and um, 
approve, uh, allow the town clerk to complete the hiring pro or the town administrator to complete the hiring process, which is the offer letter and discussion like that. Do we have a motion? Yeah, I'll make that motion, Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, do we have a second? Um, I, I wanted to ask a question, but. Um, yeah, go ahead and second. And then we'll I'll second it and then we'll have discussion. Yes, discussion, please. Uh, so I just wanted to, I, I'm assuming that during this process, um, one of my concerns about the, the department is a lack of a, a good filing system where, e, you know, sometimes things need to be filed in two or three different places in order to be able to find them. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure you discussed this kind of skills with her. We did. Because we need a massive reorganization in there. Yeah. Jen, do you want to speak to that for Tim? Yes, sure. Um, so that was one of the, the areas in our questioning and to make sure that how organized this person is and what her skills were both on computers and with coming up with um, a process without prompting. And she seems to be very well versed and capable of doing that and taking it on because the building department has some slow times during the winter months and we would really need somebody that would you know take that on and and tackle it and she seems to be very skilled and a go-getter and just um right. even when i checked her references that's something that they said about her was that uh she's very organized right so i think so that could be helpful tim it's a great question yeah any any further questions? No, no. That's just know that it, that office could use someone like her. <laughs> yes. No, that sounds great. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you, and thank you to the group of staff and Jen and Casey and everyone else who's been involved Bob with involved in everybody Jen to get involved. both of these positions yeah. filled because it's super important. It, it, it was a, an uphill battle, but I think we're making some progress. So I appreciate it. <laughs> I caught your clap on the inside, too. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's see. So, do we have anything else uh, with, oh, community preservation? Can I ask a question? Oh, please. So, go I ahead. actually asked this question of Jen a few minutes ago. So, at some point, maybe Tim, you can chime in. I don't remember this, but at some point, somebody said that Kate Lawless might be interested in community preservation. I don't know if that's the case, but we carried that sort of question forward on this agenda. So if anybody okay. knows. Um, don't actually, yeah, I do have something to report on that. Um, and I don't know if we need to get a formal letter of interest from, from David Lawless. Oh, who's okay. Kate's, okay. Yeah, oh, Kate's David. husband. David. Okay. Um, he's a lawyer in a Springfield law firm. He's done pro bono work for the town in the past. Uh, at least the Friends of Deerfield Committee. He wrote the Articles of Incorporation, et cetera, for that nonprofit, uh, you know, gratis. So um, he would be a, a good, steady um, person. So do we need a letter from him? I mean, yes. I, I had an email exchange, but yeah, I can get him to. Helpful, Tim. Um, yeah, I can get him to submit a letter. Um, yeah, if you can ask it, he can just send an email. Yeah, an email yeah exactly. Well. That's what I mean. An email to, to you and Jen. Yes. Uh, good. And then we just, I would just want to go back and make sure that we were within the confines of the creation of Community Preservation Committee. So, yeah, he would be a select board nominee because um, until we reor, until the, concert, uh, the, the CPC reorganizes itself to rewrite its uh, legislation to allow for the senior housing committee person to be the housing authority person. Um, Lily Dwight is currently the moderator's appointee, but if that change gets made in and voted on in the fall, um, then they can uh, they can appoint Lily the senior housing person, and then the moderator can appoint another person. Um, I'm really pushing to try and get nine active members on that board. So, um, but for the short term, I think um, David would be wonderful. So I'll follow up with him and get him to right. send in a letter of interest. Yeah. We can Thank you, Tim. Support him for sure. Uh, you have other um, like local so, CIPC, and do you want yeah. to just hit on any of these? Or? I just want to hit on a couple of things. So there was some the there is a list for the board to look out for CIPC. We okay. also have a public weighers list, so the board needs to approve those appointments. Um, the CIPC list 
I went back and I looked at the, uh, the bylaw. And so one of the responsibilities of the select board is to confirm the nominated people from the different committees. Okay. And we still have a treasure collective vacancy and a finance committee vacancy because I don't know that they have, have voted somebody to participate because they had a change right. in membership. So, so they may at their meeting today or they may have, but I don't know. So we'll wait so, on that. But in terms of what we do know, the names that are there are confirmed. Okay. Um, the reason you say, I think it says, let me just check something real quick. Yeah, so one thing to keep in mind is that treasure collector. Mm -hmm. So in the bylaw, both the treasurer collector and the town administrator sit on the committee as ex officio non-voting members. Right. Um, so I just put the title in. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, I asked Pat to put the title in. So I think that will help us make sure that the committee's properly, properly confirmed yep. is really what it is. So do you need a motion on these? Yes, please. So make a motion to... Uh, approve the capital improvement planning committee for the year uh, 2023. Casey Warren, uh, Carolyn Shores Ness, um, Albert Olmstead, Ken Cutterback, Denise Mason, and Charles A. Shattuck III. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the second? Oh, second. Sorry. <laughs> Any I'm further just, discussion? I was, I was um, just trying to uh, figure out how many we had actually vacant. All those, uh, all those. You have two you have two vacancies besides the treasurer collector. Right. So we have a vacancy. Um, finance, which will we have get finance. Fine. We'll, that should get filled but relatively. Also right. The moderator has another. Yes. So the, the moderator. moderator has a vacancy as well, and I don't okay. know what whether right. there's been any just, movement on that. Yeah. So does the moderator have two appointments? Yes. Yes. Yeah. They so have two appointments. Skip is one of those appointments. Yep. Mark Brennan's moved to finance committee, so and, and the moderator, they sort of flip places. And the moderator has appointments to the finance committee that needs to be filled as well. They do, and I don't know what they are. I did reach out to Dan. He was going to get back to me, but I okay. haven't heard back. I know there's some interest in finance, um, so or has been. Right. Um, so all those in favor? I um, Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Nessel. Great. Okay, so that's good. Any others you need? Oh, the weighers? Public uh, weighers. So I'll make a motion to appoint the public weighers for... Um, 2023, Corey Hamilton, Ryan Price, Sean Telega, Aaron Campbell, Brian Bachalis, Miles Downey, Tyler Schoenfeld, uh, Janine Savoy, Robert Green, Leo Ciccone, um, Don Gazakis, Brian Willis, and Jim Lavaki. I'll second that. All those in favor or any further um, discussion? I do want to add, just ask, I know we discussed these public wares before. Yeah. Um, could you just refresh my memory about what we're doing here? What they do? Yeah. So do you want me? You can do so uh, you can help me. I'll help. But I think they uh I think they weigh they weigh the trucks, right? That come yeah. through um like a lot of times up at uh, True Stone quarries or any other quarries in town. Um you know, they have to make sure that what's on the truck and all that is, is weighed out correctly. And mm -hmm. it's actually a very old requirement in the mm. statute. A public weigher has to be named in order to officially act in that capacity at any place where you you're weighing it, yeah. asphalt. Right. Typically products. asphalt mm -hmm. or usually asphalt that's going out on the road. So, and these people are employees of places yep. where weighing needs to they be are. done. Yep. They are. Okay, so they're not necessarily well. residents of Deerfield. No, 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 no. Okay. Actually, most of them are not. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to understand because I didn't recognize. <laughs> yeah, any of the people. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we had a did we we had a vote right? We had a we had a second, okay. and now we're going to. Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Right. Thank you. Any others we have? That's it. Right. I think so. At the moment. And thank you for the full list. So, yes. Super grateful we have a, for that. Mr. Chair, may I make a comment? You can. That? So, I, because we had some difficulty with this this year, um, I'd like to initiate a database development tool. It would be something like a flat 
Excel database. Um, we actually did this in Ashfield for similar reasons because we were having trouble take, keeping track of when people were um, their terms, but also their uh, contact information and a bunch of other things. So I know they have something. I know that the um, clerk staff keep track of this for purposes of their own work in sending out open meeting law guidance and information. But for our purposes, I think if we had an easily used database, it could help us create some more we accuracy. When uh, either Wendy was here or maybe it was Doug at the time, we did See, it. I and can't it find just, anything. No, you wouldn't. It, it was a program that we signed on to and it was up on the website so everybody could see what was there. And the problem is, is the time of staff to keep updating it and doing right. it all the time. But if it's an easy thing that you can implement well, and Pat can manage or whoever you delegate to manage, I'm all for that. I for mean, sure. I think once you load everything and everybody's contact information, then you just keep it up. Yeah, that's the key is the, and so the that's, management the, and the so time. That, that time management piece, but also once people, what, what happens is, is when you're appointing people functionally, I used to watch the town clerk do this. Functionally, when people were appointed, she took that information back, put the put their names and everything and their terms in, right? So that it would pop up um, if you did again. a search. Yes, and it yep. also allowed her to co to present reports, which I think is the hardest thing. Yeah, for uh, for us, I think if we had just even a flat database, not something yeah. that's particularly complex, right? It could be helpful just to make sure you guys for have sure. the right information. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because it does that. take time sometimes to go back and check yeah. the bylaws and stuff. Trevor. <clears throat> Jennifer. Has. Yeah, I um I was talking to Pat about the appointments and, and notifications and um getting board members to then come committee members to come in and get sworn in. So if we all have any meeting, I think remind the chairs to remind the board members to you know, come in to get sworn in because I think yep. that's like another step that um, yep. doesn't always happen. It, yeah, it gets missed. It, it sort of gets lost in translation. Well, especially sometimes. a new appointee who yes. doesn't know that they have to be sworn in. Right. 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 And and getting the paperwork. I mean, I know Pat tries to email them the paperwork, but then knowing that there's the other steps, or then um, just remember, you know, remembering that they need to come in and do it. So anyway, just a reminder for. For all of us to remind chairs to, to remind and, and just remember it's a, it's a group effort so there's staff in the clerk's office working on this there's our staff are working on it from a different perspective so that was just the reason i certainly wouldn't do anything that would interfere but at the same time i think for tracking purposes it would be helpful for us to have something we could just put information in and hopefully grab it back out quickly yeah that'd be great so i'm just going to say one it would be nice if this database could be functional like new member on the conservation commission it populates to the website with approval purposes you know like it sends over things saying you need to approve this to the website or you know you need to send out this email that reminds the commission chair that they have to have this person come in and get sworn in mm -hmm. um but i know that's a fantasy <laughs> <laughs> It's a it's good, good question. Fantasy, we can we can see fantasy. whether that can happen. No, no, no. Get the first thing started, and uh, I'm just trying to. I think it's great because it it definitely oh, yeah. will help organizationally. And even if it was as simple as vacancies show up in the spreadsheet as some other color, so you can just look. Hey, half of our boards are half empty. Yeah. Um, you know, and have the goal be to make them all be the same color, <laughs> so everybody is full and. Anyway, thanks for doing that, Casey. I think it's a good idea. Well, I just noticed we were having some difficulty. Yep. So I was just thinking Every this year. might be a good way to start. For sure. So the mail we've got, um, a thank you card from the uh, Deerfield Memorial Day Parade yes. Committee thanking us and thank, thank you for the committee for all you oh, do to, to make that happen. It was beautiful this year, really nice. And um, uh, then we also have a piece of mail here um, from our letter from the Connecting Community Initiative to the um, DEP about the needs for sewer funding. And there was a discussion about they're in encouraging us to apply for the SRF grant and loan program, which 
never really helps us super well. It doesn't, you know, it's an easy letter for them to write because they always have an option, but it really, it makes it, it's so expensive for us to pay back because it's only a 20 year note. And so instead of like 500,000 a year, it's a million a year that you have to pay back, say the project we're working on now. Um, But I think it's worth still looking at it. There's new funding opportunities and they have low interest rates of 2% for most projects. Um, So I don't know. We'll, Let's keep plugging away. I don't know. Hopefully we can make something happen there. So um, that's all we have for mail. Um, do you, anything you want to touch on, Casey? I do. Okay. So I just want to let you know, and I'm going to ask Jennifer to hop in quickly on this. The new website launch is imminent. Great. She and Pat have been, she, I shouldn't say just she and Pat. She and Pat, Sarah, they've been busting their rear ends to get information up and to move things around and be prepared. It's going to be different people. It's going to be different. It may not be easy to use at first. The idea is to create some efficiencies, but also access to information quicker. So Jennifer, would you like to speak to some of that? Just before, can I add e-code? I couldn't find it on the old website and I know it was usually right up front. It's our, our book of codes. And maybe it was bylaws is what it was it's under. Town maybe. Bylaws. Okay. You click That's on fine. your town bylaws. Skip it. You're muted. You're muted, Jen. Which is a good function with my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> anyway, um, the website is hopefully easier to navigate because of the widgets and the tabs. However, it's just going to, it's, it's going to be a learning process, especially where people I've like, drilled it into people's heads to go to the calendar and to get the agenda there. Whereas this is slightly different and you go to the calendar and then there's a link that takes you to the agenda center. So, okay. There's places that we hold information. So a little bit different. All right. Trying to add things multiple places so that it's obvious and the link will be right there to click it, it's not like a, if you click on the calendar, the link will be right there. Um, we're going to have to do some training sessions and Casey and I were talking about it. It just takes, <laughs> it takes an immense amount of time. We only have two months. So Friday is the launch date. Um, we have two months after the launch date that we can still access information on our old site to bring it over to our current site. So there may be some things that are missing that we need to bring over and we're working on it. There's just, we don't really, you know, we don't have an IT department that does that for us. So we're gradually learning. And then, you know, we are finding out things and talking to the people at Civic Engage, helping us fix things like um, Pat noticed that they merged our water districts and our fire districts, because they didn't understand how everything was separate. So they just sort of clumped it all together and put it under one title. So fixing things like that before we launch, fixing links that are broken, taking out information that's old. Uh, It's been a process, but it will be better. It's beautiful. (laughs) um, It looks nice. And I I think that with the widgets and the the naming, it it should be clear. And we did get something that we were very nervous about. We had thousands, thousands of people who get alerts from different pages of our website. Like they have registered their emails and their phone numbers into our system. And we were afraid that that information was not going to be exported over and everybody would have to sign up again. And we got news yesterday that it was exported over. And so- like few. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's Did that well, include the rave system, Jennifer? Yes. Okay, okay. good. Because I just had a panic moment when you said yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the there's the link at the bottom that does those alerts for that. Um I also have talked to them about you know what we need for the wastewater treatment plant for those alerts. Because um, we also have that SSO notification. Yes. So this is one of the things that transitions. Yep. And I just want everybody to know, 
the staff has worked so hard on this, but it's an uphill battle and people are not going to be There'll familiar be with it. Yeah, it'll take time. And it's going to take a while. So they may get crabby. The it's intent okay. is to try to make this more workable. If and, Carolyn and, can get on a meeting from her house, you you massive succeed, you know. <laughs> Jennifer's got a fix for that. You gotta click a link and it's calendar. Yeah. It's it's the right there. It's you don't even have to open the agenda, Carolyn. No. The link it out, Carolyn. The link right. so happy. Tim, Tim, you've got your hand up. There's a minimum bar. Yeah. A couple of things. One is um in the old iteration when the calendar was there, um, unless an agenda had been, I don't know how it worked, unless an agenda had been posted. Um you it's didn't know there. the meeting was going to take place. So, so like, for instance, the select board has regular meetings scheduled. And if you looked at the calendar on Friday, you didn't see a 13th meeting listed. Right. So this current calendar, I hope it has regularly scheduled meetings, even if an agenda is not posted. Yes. So any of the reoccurring meetings, I can set up a calendar event that shows the reoccurring meeting. However, the boards that go from well, we can't meet on this day that we got to meet on this day. We don't, that will not happen. We I don't have the capacity to, there's sure. literally two of us. Yep. And it's only important because I'm on the select board now. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's a reoccurring meeting, I have put like, I have the foot clinic. I did it myself. So that will populate for two years, the foot clinic on the first Very Thursday. Nice. Of <laughs> that nice. will show up on the calendar. Right. But that's the kind of thing that we want you know, the regular stuff, obviously additional meetings for the select board, random changing of meetings, you can't anticipate, but if, if we hardly ever change our meetings, so it should be out. Yeah. People should be able to see it. Yeah. So what I did is every other, every other week, you know, well, start thank you, that will thank show you the so meeting. Much. Thank you so much for the extra work. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. I hope everybody likes it and I, I and I'll say it now and I've said it many times before if you hate it I didn't do it. <laughs> Some of it's the platform but I'm hoping it'll be a little bit easier to use. And I hope you launch it after five o'clock on Friday so that you can go home and enjoy the weekend. It's not it's like noon but hopefully nobody will notice because it's gonna you know it's a Friday. It's me crossing my fingers. Yeah. Anything else? Chris, Chris is Chris is already saying he's going to look at it. Oh, thanks, Chris. It's on eight thirty. What did he say? He checks calendars on Friday, so he's going to be looking at it. Well, any other things you want yeah, to hit on? I have a couple okay. of other things. So Let's right now we're roll. in the middle of the year in closure. So yep. particularly Brenda and I are really busy not only developing the transfers, but we've also been working on encumbrances and stuff. So that's been taking up a bit of time. We've also had these outreach meetings that you mentioned earlier in the meeting. So you had one with uh, Congressman McGovern. We had the MDOT discussions. I expect those to continue. So that'll create a little bit of work in the office. Mm -hmm. um, as Tim, as we all noted, Tim's heading up communication with Hamshaw. We do have some intersects. Uh, in the office, and that may be true of other projects. We, we're in the situation where grants are all finalizing. We've got final reports and reimbursements we have to get through. MVP is one of them. Green Communities is one of them. So we'll need to be focusing um, at least two people for a day to get through those. And we've got some other, I've been working with council on several items. So um, it's just it's busy in the office mm -hmm. and i want everybody to understand that that's it's Priority. not just normal work no it's, i know it's other projects coming up so we're trying to close out a bunch of things okay um and that's really is there anything else you need to add jennifer about coming from our office well as everybody knows we're down staff in both the clerk's office and the building Apart, yep. you know, department, and so that has taken up a lot of my time. It's just the hiring process, and then also trying to keep up with emails and and yeah. and you know, just things. Um, sort of compounded. Yeah, and Alex has been great, and it's just Alex it's trying to to answer emails and get calls, and he's put when he's not there out of office, so people can reach out to me, 
and I can answer questions. So we're just, you know, tag teaming it, <laughs> and try to keep you everything, work. you know, flowing and, and working. So a lot of other things that we're helping Casey is sort of, I'm trying to help that. So it, it's, we're just juggling at the moment. So as soon as we get fully staffed, I'm looking forward to that. Mm. Yeah. And That'd there be will great. be a training uptick. Of so course. Yeah. Knows. It takes time for people to but get, get just some onboarding, yep. but I'm hoping we'll be in better shape by this time next month. Okay. Okay. Entertain a motion to adjourn. I will make that motion. I'll second it. Thank you. All those in favor. Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you for all you do. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Casey.